for joining this um, <laughs> so, for, for, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. so uh, thank you for joining this uh, AP uh, identification technical meeting uh, presentation. So today uh, the the schedule uh, you can browse at the website. So just share the link. Okay, so today the schedule uh, will be from 10 a.m. until 11:45 p.m. So uh, from 10 until 11, we will have uh, our invited speaker, Mr. Anwar Faiz Osman from Telecom Malaysia, uh, will be presenting his talk entitled System Architecture and Specification for Quality and Advice. So uh, we will have one hour, including 10 minutes to MA uh, at the end of the session. And then we will proceed with uh, three uh, student presentations from 11 until 11.45. Uh, so the three students will be uh, Mr. Muhammad Shami Fukri Osman from UTM uh, and Mr. Sohail Ashgar from UTHM and Mr. Arslan Ahmad from UTHM. Uh, so with that, uh, I will uh, briefly uh, uh, inform about Mr. Anwar for his Osman background. So uh, he was born in Penang, and he received Bachelor of Science uh, in Electrical Engineering from Purdue University USA in 2003. And then he has his um, master degree in Electrical and Electronics Engineering System from USM in 2015. He is currently the head of 5G product development for Telecom Malaysia, and he has published multiple technical papers on LDA, RF switches, and RF filter designs. Uh, his research interests include wireless testing for mobile operators and inference hunting. Mr. Osman has been a committee member of ASPE EB, MTTSSC, Penang Chapter since 2015, and currently serving as the chapter auditor. He is the former deputy chair of ASPE Microwave Electronic Devices and Solid State Symposium in 2018. He is part of the National 5G Task Force member and the chairperson of the 5G. Ecosystem and Timeline Sub Working Group under the Spectrum Working Group of the Task Force. He's also leading the study on the 5G and fixed satellite service, who are listed in the 5G Task Force and one of the authors of the Task Force 5G C band report and 5G Mediator Wave report. So today he will be presenting to us uh, a topic uh, titled System Architecture and Specification for 5G Advanced. So without further ado, I welcome Mr. Anwar. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Camilia. Uh, I also like to thank uh, Professor Yamada and also the uh, IEEE, AP, and also MGIT for uh, inviting me uh, to present this uh, topic today. So let me uh, share my screen. Can you see my uh, slide? Yes, you can see your slide. Okay, so uh, let me start with the uh, presentation. Yeah. So again, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, my presentation. Mister, I'm sorry, uh, you are on present to be with it. Okay, hold on. Okay, let's just remove that. Okay, now better. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, today my presentation title will be System Architecture and Specification for 5G Advance. Uh, as a background, uh, I have been working on the uh, Malaysia 5G System Architecture and Specification uh, for 5G since uh, 2020 uh, under the uh, MT, uh, Malaysia MTSB uh, technical forum. So we have this uh, technical code called IMT 2020 uh, uh, technical code GC 27-21 which was published in uh, I think around August 2021 uh, for the system and architecture specification and uh, end of last year we have submitted or published the first revision uh, of that technical code 
because uh, due to the uh, evolution of 5G itself, uh, where we include the latest uh, uh, release of uh, 3GPP, so that's where we start to go for the 5G advance. Right, so it's already uh, in the uh, Malaysia MCMC website. Yeah. So more for, uh, if everyone wants to have a look on the detail uh, specification. So uh, how uh, the working group normally uh, refer to or as a guidance for the uh, specification is uh, by looking into the ITU. Right? So, so from the ITU, it uh, designate the 3G time as IMT 2000 and then uh, IMT advance for 4G, IMT 2020, this uh, designation from ITU for 5G, hence why the technical code uh, title is itself is uh, IMT 2020. And moving forward for 6G, it will be called IMT 2030. So for the evolution in the uh, ITU uh, itself, it will go from, the, normally it has a report. Uh, importantly, they will start to have vision or recommendation on how they want to define the specification, okay, right? Uh, so, for example, for 5G, uh, the vision has been uh, published in 2015, right, uh, which is the framework of the requirement that is uh, needed for 5G. And the first report on the methodology uh, was published in 2017, right? So, we have M uh, ITUR, uh, M two two four uh M dot two four one zero uh document, and finally the specification or they call it radio interface uh technology, right? The uh, RIT release for five G is uh February twenty twenty one. That's why where we have the uh publication of our first technical code also in uh twenty twenty one, uh in correlation with the release of the RIT specification from ITU. So we look into coming 6G, right? So uh, currently they have the report already, right? Uh, and now they are going for the uh, uh, work under progress for the vision and and the framework, right? So it's, uh, it's coming, right, for 6G. All right, so this is a summary, okay, again, the designation that I want to highlight here is for our, for, for 5G will be IMT 2020, right? Uh, the main document from ITU, as I uh, mentioned in the previous slide, is uh, ITUR M.2150. Now, the radio interface technology, right? The reference will be coming from uh, mostly from TGPP, which is the uh, 5G SRIT and also the 5G RIT. But we also looking into some non uh, previously non TGPP technology, uh, which is 5GI uh, from TS, uh, T, uh, TDSI uh, India, as well as the 5G Tech SRIT. But uh, these two currently, uh, as I update these two. Uh, Standard already uh, 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 been uh, included in 3GPP as well. Okay, so for 5G, uh, there's uh, not yet, right? So we're still waiting for the first uh, report to or the vision to be published. So ITU is the uh, so-called uh, governance uh, when you come to the. Uh, generally accepted specification for 5G. But ITU normally open from NTP uh, all over the world to submit the uh, uh, so-called specification uh, as a candidate. Right? For example, when we have 4G last time, right? ITU uh, opened the uh, entity to come in with the specification. So we have two uh, uh, entities uh, submitted their requirement. The first is 3GPP. Uh, which is the uh, consortium of uh, multiple companies uh, in the in the tech industry, and uh, the second one is IEEE, right? So that is where we have two technology when the start of uh, 4G, which is first the LTE and second the WiMAX. WiMAX is actually under IEEE. So uh, the same thing uh, with uh, uh, when it comes to 5G, ITU also open up for the submission of specification, but only TGPP submitted the specification. So 
uh, the specification coming from uh, TTPP as well as the as mentioned before the TSDSI from from uh, from uh, India, but they are also now part of TTPP as well. So uh, the definition of the specs from 5G, it's, so basically what we say that uh, uh, almost entirely coming from TTPP. So it started from release 15 where they start to uh, aforemention the uh, first report of, of 5G, right? Coming into the release 16, uh, release 17 is where we we have the uh, first of the uh, so-called technical code document release. Now, when it comes to release 18, is the start of the so-called uh, definition of 5G advance, right? Uh, it was uh, released uh, last year, right? Uh, and then we're going to release 19, which is ongoing, release 20. And we are expected to have the first report of uh, 60 uh, in the year 2027 or 2028. Yeah. So here is the evolution of the cellular network, right? From the first generation to the fifth generation. So the first generation in the early uh, 80s, it will be uh, just the, uh, when you cut the, the, the first generation, it's only analog. So you are only able to do voice uh, communication, that is first generation. Okay, somewhere uh, around uh, early 90s, we start to have the uh, second generation. So this is where we start to have digital component. Uh, so for something like uh, SMS uh, has been introduced here in 2G as compared to the first generation, which is purely analog. And then moving to the uh, early 2000, we have the 3G release. So the difference between 3G and 2G will be 3G will start to be able to connect to internet. It is still basic, it is still slow, right? But the mobile device is able to connect to the internet and to uh, communicate uh, uh, in, in, in the internet, right? So that is the first instance of uh, uh, the first uh, generation that enabled the device to, to connect to the internet. Coming into the 2010, uh, we have the 4G launch. And here we, uh, we, we have the, the technology that enable truly broadband connection uh to the uh, to the internet as well as the emergence of uh cellular apps talking about uh whatsapp facebook uh all those apps uh, uh emerge uh and being utilized here in uh, the fourth generation and in the fourth generation where we start to see uh the uh majority of the cellular usage is already in the data as compared to only voice right for your 3g although you start to 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 have connection to the internet but the majority of the phone uh usage of the phone are on the analog service on on the on the voice right so that's what we call that's different in if which is 4g and 3g now we all know that 5g has been launched so what what is the different now okay what is the different so for 5g the, the 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 different will be on the use cases right so we have the enhanced mobile broadband which is the the enhancement of the mobile broadband that we see in 4g and then we have the other two use cases where it's uh, meant for industry which is the ultra low latency uh, as well as the massive machine uh, connectivity okay so here is the use case of 5g this is different between uh, between 5G and the rest of the other technology, right? So, your cellular phone that you're using the 5G SIM card, 5G services now is using this EMBB or Enhanced Mobile Broadband Communication. Uh, but when we want to go for industrial uh, usage, it will be either using the ultra low latency communication or for multiple device connectivity is the machine machine type of uh, communication so we are looking to this triangle so this normally i think uh, a lot of you have seen the presentation of 5g you will always see this triangle of uh use case okay so the 5g use case versus latency and data rate 
So uh, if you look at here, this is the throughput. So the moving to the right is a higher throughput usage uh, use cases. And this is the latency. So here is a slow latency and here is a uh, fastest latency or the the low lowest value of, of a millisecond, lah, right? So when we're talking about uh, sensors, uh, these are the devices, uh, machine to machine, uh, device remote control or bi-directional remote control. So you can see that it is in the uh, uh, low throughput and a low latency type of uh, uh, use case, right? Uh, but if you want to go for the uh, autonomous vehicle, right, or uh, the capability of vehicle to call for the emergency, which is called automotive ECAL, so you need high latency. You need high latency. You don't need throughput because it's just send the signal, disaster alert, right, uh, earthquake, tsunami, because you want to have fast response, uh, but your throughput is low, right? Just send a, a, a message. Uh, then we we go for video streaming. Video streaming, you need throughput right not necessarily on the uh, latency because when you watch the video even it's a bit low latency uh, you you can still there's there's no like so called the critical uh, effect but you need the throughput because you need high clarity right uh, when you assess your personal card you need the throughput because you are downloading data okay uh, but you don't need uh, so high uh, latency uh multi-person video call uh, you need both the throughput and also latency because multi-person you don't want to lose the message right so that's why you still need latency and because it's a video call that you need the throughput right so and then you go on to see like all those augmented reality virtual re reality is where we want to use 5g and this is where we have we need to have both the uh, ultra low latency and the mobile broadband capability of this use case right so we come to 5g we have to define what is the use case that you are you are looking for and uh, uh compare that to the latency and the throughput uh, re uh requirement okay now uh let's go to the main filler for the 5g right uh first when you talk about 5G as compared to the uh, other uh, technology is the new uh, frequency, especially at the uh, higher uh, band range, which is at the uh, millimeter wave. Okay, it's called millimeter wave, right? 26 to 39 gigahertz. This is only enabled in 5G. Uh, 4G, you only have lower than 6 uh, gigahertz of uh, frequency range or even lower than 3 gigahertz. And then you have multi-connectivity where you have the 5G can be connected to the 4G core. Uh, before we start to move from the 5G to be connected uh, with the 5G core, right? So for when when the 4G is connected, uh, sorry, when the 5G uh, radio is connected to the 4G core, it is called the uh, NSA or non-standalone. And uh, for this setup, now uh, this uh, for for this connectivity. Uh, we only enable the EMBB, which is the enhanced mobile broadband. You don't have the capability of the low latency. If you want to have the, the capability of the low latency, then it has to be a standalone where the 5G uh, radio connect to the uh, 5G core, right? Uh, then we uh, the third pillar will be the massive MIMO or the beam forming. If you look at the some of the building, right, where you have all the antennas, uh, the cellular antennas, right, the 4G antenna and 5G antenna, you can see the, the 4G antenna, you have the uh, radio, uh, which is called a remote radio head, and then you have a cable connect to the uh, antenna. But for 5G, it's just a panel, right? This panel is a radio and, and the antenna are attached together. And that panel is actually consists as uh, of small uh, active uh, antenna patches and these antenna patches uh, electronically control so it can create a, a beep right uh, to transmit the signal in a direction okay so and then we, we know that in terms of the propagation the higher the frequency the lower the propagation capability right so as the frequency goes higher we need to apply beamforming so that we can 
uh, maximize the power uh, uh, to the intended target, right? So you have a smaller beam, but that is can go stronger to compensate for the loss of propagation at higher frequency, especially in the millimeter wave range. Then uh, the the last uh, different for 5G compared to 4G is the network flexibility. So basically, uh, the sub carrier sp spacing uh, in 4G is fixed, right? In uh, at 15 kilohertz, but for the uh, 5G, it is uh, flexible depending on the use case. So 15, 30, 60, or 120 uh, sub spacing. Then this create the uh, scenario where you, where you can have uh, slicing capability and also some software defined uh, function uh, for the network. Right. So these four are the main pillars of uh, the five G new radio. So when we go to five G advanced, we we want to talk more about the ultra low latency uh, animation machine. So these are the new services that can be uh, enabled by the telco uh, as a business. Uh, first is network slicing, where you can assign a specific resource to the services uh, without being interrupted by uh, any other services uh, that is using the, the base station. Right? Second is a fixed wireless uh, access, where it is sometimes it is called air fiber right uh so you if you have a condition where it's hard to put in the uh, fiber physically uh, then you can have a, a base station and transmit the uh, fixed wireless access where we can have a capability as similar to the fiber connection uh remember we will talk about the uh the where you can have uh different sub spacing then you can do the uh, network slicing right so from the, from there you can do a private network where you from the from the same resource from, from same uh, uh public uh position you can slice a specific resource to a business company there where it will not it will be detached from the public services so you have a a, a guaranteed service to the business for example for manufacturing or logistics or, or healthcare, and uh, we can also uh, include the cloud computing uh, closer to the uh, use case, right? To to have this uh, low latency uh, processes, for example, using AR VR to connect to the cloud uh, services and so on. Okay, so. What's the difference now between 5G and 6G? So when we talk about 5G, 5G so we have this triangle, right? EMBB, EMTC, URC. So we have three points. So for 6G, it will become six. Okay, so uh, we have immersive communication here at EMBB and at URC is a hyper-reliance. And in between, we have AI and communication. Uh, in between, Massive, com massive machine and also EMBB, we have integrated sensing and communication. And between massive machine and URC, you have uh, the ubiquitous uh, connectivity. So this will be the new, well, this is not finalized yet, but I've seen this uh, in some of the reports uh, for 6 right? Uh, under this uh, ITUR M2160, the framework of the 6 okay? And here is the new capabilities uh, of 6G, as well as nine enhanced capabilities. So, you, of course, we talk about AI eh, nowadays, right? So, it will be part of the 6G uh, capability, as well as the uh, the uh, very accurate positioning. Because in future, you're going to have a lot of autonomous uh, vehicle, a lot of drones, right? So, yeah, so we need to know the position of the all this uh, machine uh, in a in a very accurate uh, position right so key enhancement in 5g uh, advanced as we move to 6g uh, we will have we 
to enable AR VR and you know like Apple already have the Apple Vision uh, device uh, already in the market, right? So we this will be part of the URC uh, capability of 5G, okay? Uh, and and next we have the enhanced coverage. Uh, how do we extend the coverage further? Even though we have the beam forming, what are the things that we can do? Uh, my more for from right uh, the uh, antenna capability again this is also to to basically enhance the coverage and increase the uh, throughput for both downlink and uplink uh, we we want now you know like Malaysia we already uh, sunset uh, 3G we also want to sunset 2G so how 5G can be used to uh, replace all this uh, GSM machine to machine uh, communication uh and we're talking about machine to machine we go to this evolution beyond smartphone so how do we include 5g in the cctv in the sensors right in the uh smart devices so in 5g we have the red cap or, to, uh, or you call it reduced capability where it actually uh reduce uh some of the things that the machine does not use for example voice capability and so on and so to reduce the cost so that the industry can uh, use it as well as uh, can put it in the uav or in the vehicle right as i mentioned accurate positioning is important because you know like we have a autonomous vehicle you have drones multiple drones that are moving uh, simultaneously so we need to know the positioning right so how the base station and the devices uh so called uh, synchronized to some sort of maybe satellite uh, uh positioning lah, right uh, as a reference and uh, this is also include the resilient timing okay so uh means that if there is a disconnect uh signal from satellite maybe due to rain and so on the system will be ab still able to have an accurate uh, timing right uh network efficiency okay so uh, i will explain this uh further also right uh, later so now you have uh fdd and also tdd right so you see duplex and the uh, and the uh time duplex both have pro and cons so how to enhance this further by combining a hybrid fdd and TDD, tdd uh uh operation enhanced cycling enhanced cycling means that the vehicle or device can connect to each other rather than maybe one device or one vehicle connect to the base station and the other devices may, may not able may not need to connect to the base station, but connect to the device that is connected to the base station. that's called the cycling okay and then uh enhanced mobility uh which is to uh, uh to reduce the latency uh even further by utilizing uh the uh, higher frequency uh spectral capability All right so this is the announcement that we are looking in the 5g advance okay so when you talk about reference uh just a quick one right so for 5g ran 5g uh core uh 5g qos and the frequencies uh, see these are the terminology used for tgpp right from the tgpp document also from the external uh, previously external uh, parties like 5 gi uh, this is from india and this is that sg srit this is uh, from i can't remember but uh, all these are the standards that define uh, the 5g specification okay so and this is uh, to specify the usage scenario uh, performance as well as the system architecture Okay, uh, and uh, the specification is uh, listed in this IMT 2020 radio interface uh, technical performance. And in Malaysia is the technical code uh, of IMT 2020 uh, first revision, which includes the 5G advance. Okay, so this is a general requirement, uh, basically for enhanced mobile broadband or the uh, so-called mobile uh, services. Uh, we're looking at the 100 Mbps as a, specific, uh, as a spec, right? 
So when you do a download, when you do uh, maybe check your phone uh, with the file service with Ookla, it has to at least achieve 100 megabit per second. And then we go to the use case ultra low latency. It's actually, uh, we're looking at one millisecond uh, for some of the uh, services. For example, remote surgery, right? Or, or using the AR, VR uh, capability. Uh, so we want it to be as low as uh, one millisecond. Uh, machine machine connectivity is one million device per kilometer square, right? So you want to have massive devices at the plantation or connected to the drone and so on. So it has to be have the capability to connect 1 million devices with at least a quality of service of 32 byte packet per uh, 10 seconds. Okay. So this is a general requirement uh, for, for 5G and 5G advance. Uh, as I mentioned, when the, the multi-connectivity pillar of 5G, right? Uh, you have the 5G NSA, where the 5G uh, uh, radio connected to the 4G core, and also the 5G SA, when the radio is, uh, is connected to 5G, uh, the, the 5G core as a standalone uh, setup. So when you talk about 5G advanced, it has to be on the 5G SA. Then only you can utilize the features uh, uh, that is enabled by 5G. Right? It's no longer looking at NSA. NSA is only the 5G basic. Okay, so I will not go uh, detail uh, into this, but just to show that uh, when you talk about 5G advance, it has to be uh, the standalone uh, configuration. Okay. Uh, in terms of core network, uh, there is this is the specification uh, based on the TGBP release uh, 17. Uh, some of these are, are quite uh, technical terms, are, but we have the network slicing. Again, only be enabled by the 5G SA. Eh? And then network automation for 5G, uh, security, uh, wireless and wireline, wireline convergence of uh, 5G, uh, the local area network support in 5G, uh, streaming services and also HQPT uh, in the 5G core. Okay, so this is on the core side, and for the RAN side, on the uh, so-called antenna side, right? We have the further announcement in the MIMO, and also uh, further announcement for the radio for ultra low latency, uh, EMBB and massive IoT, such as the positioning, right? So you see that from this is the 5G basic and the 5G advanced, we have the difference in the frequency uh, rec uh, recommendation by ITU as well. Right? For example, here we only up to 52.6 gigahertz, but for 5G advanced, we can uh, allocate up to 71 gigahertz with uh, supported channel for a, a lot more supported channel bandwidth up to 2 gigahertz. This is to increase the capability. For example, you want zero millisecond close to zero millisecond of latency then you need uh the the, the big bandwidth here and to have this big bandwidth the space is only available at the higher frequency that's why it's, we have more uh, option at this side okay uh also on the 5g system we it, uh, should be enabled the multi-operator uh, Mok, uh, either is a by the Mokan approach or Moran, Moran approach. Mokan is where Malaysia is using. For example, our five G, our five G setup in Malaysia is Mokan, multi operator core network. Okay, so this is the base station, right? It's from the DMB, and the core network is via the each operator. Okay, so this is our our setup. So this is uh, for the uh, multi operator setup of the five G. And this is the uh, specification for the quality of service. Okay. Uh, again, I will not dwell too much into here. You can look into the document. Uh, this is for release 15. And this is for release 16, where you can see that not much enhancement for EMBB, but a lot of enhancements on ultra low latency. So these are all new, right? Uh, this is to increase especially the autonomous vehicle v2x mean vehicle to everything vehicle to the cellular system uh, vehicle 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 and uh, device so uh, 
a lot of new uh, QoS mapping included for the URLC. So this may give you an idea of where, as a student, as a university student, uh, you want to do the uh, research. Uh, one of it is on the, uh, of course, the AR, VR, and also the second one is the uh, autonomous vehicle, right? Uh, frequency, as I mentioned, uh, we have uh, this new frequency uh, for FR2, as I already shown before, right? So for uh, one I, I forgot to mention is even in FR1, they have increased from 6 gig to uh, 7.125 gigahertz as a recommendation for sub-6 uh, frequency. Although it's still called sub-6, but it's no longer uh, N at 6 gig, but uh, N at 7.125 gigahertz. From 410 meg to 7.12 uh, gigahertz. And for uh, FR2, right, the millimeter wave start from 34.2 gigahertz up to 71 right, uh, gigahertz. Okay, so these are the extension of frequency as recommended by GPP. Okay, so uh, just now we meant I, I go through the summary of uh, the detail specification, the hard spec. Right, uh, the quality of service, uh, the frequency, uh, in terms of uh, what we want to achieve at the use cases. Uh, I would like to also uh, now, since uh, we are talking uh, about uh, moving towards CC, and some of you are researchers, uh, students, so these are some suggested uh, research area uh, for us to, to, to go from now, 5G advance to CC. Remember where we want to do the enhancement, right? We want to uh, enhance the coverage, right? We want to increase the mobility, uh, increase the uh, uh, the accuracy of the positioning. And how do we make use of 5G to do machine to machine connectivity, uh, connectivity right? So these are some of the uh, area that uh, have potential for research, okay? So, in terms of uh, enhancement, efficiency, and extension. Enhancements means coverage expansion, enhancement in, in performance, and also access to convergence between device, uh, machine, human, and, and so on. Efficiency, how to better use your resource, uh, the fudgy resource, the uh, how to manage the pro and cons for FGD and also the TDD, right? Uh, how to make the network smart. Uh, another one is extension. Uh, to extend the 5G services, for example, to AR, VR, right? Or technology extension to uh, uh, vehicle to vehicle uh, communication. Okay. So, one way to achieve this uh, is to enhance the high frequency uh, coverage via this uh, RIS or reconfigurable intelligence surface, right? So we have the uh, devices, which is it's something like an antenna, right? Uh, it's using a meta material, right? Uh, either the pin diode, liquid crystal, or even a transparent. It can be at the, uh, as, as a glass, as a window, right? So basically what it does is that it extends the coverage via the reflection, okay? So you can see a signal coming here and reflect at the RIS material to go to the intended target, okay? So this is the for the RIS, right? So basically for the RIS, it will increase the, uh, help to increase the coverage expansion Right, especially at the uh, millimeter, millimeter wave uh, range. Because you see millimeter wave very low propagation as compared to sub gig or sub gig. So you can increase this by actually using the uh, RS to make it uh, smarter. You see, if you have a base station here, you can, because it's a, it has a obstruction or uh, another uh, building, direct signal cannot reach the person. Right, So you use RS to reflect, right, that's one way. 
and then RIS also can be used to uh, indoor, right? So indoor coverage. So a, a lot of problem with 5G right now is that there's not much coverage indoor. Outdoor, yes, you have the public network. But you go indoor, then you lose the 5G. So one of the things that you can do to uh, uh, so-called enhance indoor is the uh, using the RIS uh, capability. Okay. So this is a basic RS how it works. We have uh, the device here, right? Uh, is uh, one of the material that uh, the the so-called technology they use is uh, using pin diodes, okay, uh, in the circuit. And the okay, so this is the uh, uh, so-called architecture use versus the frequency that it enable to do the RS. For example, pin diode. RF switches, vector diodes, MEMS, and 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 the uh, uh, meta material. Okay, and this is the comparison of different uh, RS uh, technique, lah, right? If you use a pin diode, uh, vector diode, or liquid crystal, liquid crystal is something that you can see the glass. It's transparent, so you can put it in the bus, the train, in the building, right? So it will not it will not look a bit different. It will look like natural, right? But it can still behave like a, 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 a RIS to reflect the signal intelligently okay uh, another issue that we have is uh, the non-efficiency of the duplex right uh, you can either have the FDD right or the TDD FDD you have good latency because downlink and uplink especially at uplink uh, uh, downlink and uplink they have separate frequency okay uh, but it has a bad uh, uplink throughput. Also, it doesn't make use of the total spectrum because you separate it and then you have a gap somewhere, right? But for TDD, okay, you are using the same spectrum, uh, but you can both have both uh, uplink and downlink together. But the problem is you are losing latency because you are sharing the time. So remember, TDD means time, right? Time duplex. And latency is also time. So when you need time to do the switch between uh, uplink and downlink, you also reduce the, the latency, okay? So in future, what, what we want to do is to do a combined TDD and FTT duplex through the subband division. So I'm not sure how the detail, but it's basically to mitigate the cons of both TDD and FTD, uh, TDD and FTD, and to, for that, we can utilize only the advantage of uh, both uh, duplex uh, method, okay? Uh, next, uh, how do we get ubiquitous connectivity? We go to the plantation. It's a very wide area, but you don't have a lot of base station because, you know, there's not, not much population, but you want to put the device uh, that is connected to 5G. So one of it is to use the satellite service, the 5G non-terrestrial network. Right, so that we can have a uh, uh, low ubiquitous ob uh, uh, connectivity uh, for 5G. Okay. Uh, another one uh, will be the uh, cellular vehicle to everything. Right, this is also a good uh, area of studies. Uh, in fact, in MCMC, uh, we also have the technical, uh, the, uh, under the MCMC FTSB, we also have a group, working group, uh, chaired by Dr. Ruzi from uh, UTM on this uh, V2X. So we want to define the specification on uh, the vehicle to uh, base station, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to device, right? As a precursor to have the autonomous vehicle uh, in, in the country, okay? So you can see here, uh, in uh, V2X uh, connectivity, you have this uh, so-called UU connectivity, which is between the vehicle and the network, right? Or the, let's say this, traffic light to the network, uh, and also maybe from any other uh, device to the network, it's called UU. And the side link communication is called PC5. It's like between vehicle to vehicle. Okay, this vehicle is connected to the network, but this vehicle is not, so it is connected via this vehicle, via the PC5. So this is the side link. Right, side link. Okay, this is the main connection. Okay, so even the human, when we have the smartwatch or handphone, we will connect to the uh, the vehicle via this uh, side link connectivity. So 
So to to have to uh, successfully uh, go for autonomous vehicle, we need everything to be connected. So that there is that there is emergency, the sensor will send to the whole system so that we can the the car can stop or to reroute to make sure that the traffic is smooth and uh, no accident to have zero accident. Okay. Right. For example, here this is the uh, scenario where you want to have the PC5 connection between the vehicle, right? Uh, corporate, this is called the unicast communication, one car to one car only, or you can have a multicast communication, one car to many cars, or you have the broadcast uh, communication. Broadcast communication, this car is actually uh, got, uh, sorry, maybe got uh, some issue, then it will broadcast to all the car that it has an issue. For this is for emergency brake line, like uh, warning, for example. Okay. All right. So I think we have reached the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, then we we can go uh, next. Go to the uh, question and answer session, Doctor Camilla. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mister Anwar. For the very uh, insightful uh, talk is now. So uh, with that, uh, I open for Q and A uh, now. I think around um, we have around thirteen minutes. Shall we? Right. So uh, any question from the call? Yeah. Oh, sense. So sense. Yamada will ask first. Yeah. This is Yamada. Thank Hi. you very much. Very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you. So uh, this time uh, <coughs> uh, meeting, it's a uh, first meeting of uh, this AT technical meeting start. So as a, a first meeting, we, we get very interesting uh, presentation. We are very happy and uh, satisfying. <laughs> so uh, I have uh, many, uh, today's uh, as for the uh, research area, uh, you show many, uh, interesting research areas yeah so uh, that may be here for the ap research antenna and propagation researchers uh, to um, find out new research subjects correct so, <laughs> very okay. interesting yeah, thank so, you that was very helpful for uh, antenna and propagation research yes I think I think uh, one of the thing if you look at the uh, research area is a combination between communication and antenna yes. together. Yeah. For example, RIS, right? RIS, the material you want to design it is uh, microwave and also antenna technology. But mm. to transmit the signal is propagation communication. So it is a combination of uh, discipline now. The, to 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 go into that uh, research, yeah. Mm, yes, uh, the mm, <coughs> deep computer uh, intelligent uh, reflector that is the combination of propagation and antenna technology. Right. Yes. Yeah. Now many uh, such uh, subjects are shown. Yes. In future, so, a lot a lot will be like that. It's a combination, merging of the uh, the areas. Yes. Uh, as for the known. Uh, terrestrial network, you show many uh, communication links. Yes. Yes. Uh, here, so uh, in 6G, undersea communication also uh, including. Correct, correct. <laughs> uh, I think. Uh, at, at, at the moment, the focus is uh, we want to have obligators connectivity in the surface area first, right? Yes. Uh, because uh, this is where uh, we have the, the the need. For example, right, so you have plantation. Plantation normally is very rural area. So mm -hmm. you don't have the base station connectivity to connect your devices. Uh, let's say you put a sensor at the durian farm or, or the vegetable farm but you cannot connect to the base station. So one way is to use 
satellite communication, but it is still a 5G technology, 5G NTN technology, so that all this signal is is low throughput, so it is okay can uh, can use by the satellite signal, and then go back to the uh, 5G core, right? So basically, the core network for for the uh, for the non-terrestrial network is actually at the at the space. Now you are right. Uh, in future, we have to look into undersea as well. Maybe in the fishing, you know, fishing industry or tourism industry. Uh, but that one is later. Uh, it has is 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 still in the early stage. But you can see that satellite communication is started to commercialize already. So it depends. Uh, if you want to look at really future, then it will be undersea technology. Uh, <laughs> but something that can be commercialized now will be on the satellite. Mm -hmm. So from now, the undersea uh, is uh, become more uh, <coughs> useful. Uh, right. To find a uh, layer uh, of metal and uh, many things is under. Yes. Sea. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have to design the the material that is can. Uh, we stand the salt water and everything so yeah it's it's it, you have to combine the the area of studies propagation and also maybe chemistry you know uh, uh the the material engineering yeah okay thank you uh, so one, one more question so uh in 5g there is three frequency range 700 megahertz 3.5 and millimeter wave so uh, please uh, let me know, uh, explain some uh, in Malaysia, what is the deploy deployment of the system now? Okay. In a, generally, uh, we, we in, in the specification, uh, in specification, they actually two only, uh, FR1 and FR2. <laughs> uh, FR1, they call it the sub-6, okay, which include the 700 megahertz actually also in f1 the fr2 is uh the uh millimeter wave okay this is in tgpp and also in uh, itu they only call it f this two only but when uh when the when we talk in industry we normally say three because why because we have this triangle okay so we have this triangle so we try we we define the frequency range based on this this triangle so uh sub six uh between 700 meg to six gigahertz we call it the for the cellular network okay that's why it's called embb uh millimeter wave uh they generalize it for the ultra low latency right? for, because we have the big space for the uh, for the resource for the low latency and sub seven 700 meg and below they call it for mmtc for so-called the uh, uh machine to machine connectivity okay because it, it uses uh we, because we want the, the coverage but we don't need the throughput right but is that is like unofficial usage of uh, terminology but uh, the official usage is only uh two lah, right the the uh, so-called fr1 and fr2 now in malaysia there are three frequency that is uh awarded uh to the uh, wholesale network provider which is number one is uh band n28 uh 700 megahertz this is fgd right uh i think it's the is from 703 to 743 for uplink and 758 to 798 megahertz for the downlink second frequency range is from 3.4 to 3.6 uh gigahertz but I think the public network is using from 3.4 to 3.5, uh, if, if I'm not wrong. So this is called the C-band frequency. That uh, basically, uh, it, this is the main frequency range that we are using right now with with, with our phone uh, in Malaysia to, for the 5G data service. And uh, lastly, the millimeter wave, uh, which is 26.5 to 28.1 gigahertz. But I'm not sure whether there is a use case or where this is uh, being used. But if you look at the base station that you see on the road or on top of the building, uh, you can see two antenna. 
one is for the 700 meg lte uh so the the host network use that for the lte because we are still using for an nsa and also the 3.5 is a uh, the uh the my more antenna for the 5g so that is a three frequency range the millimeter wave i have uh, i have no uh, information the mm -hmm. main data is from the three four uh the the 3.4 to 3.5 gigahertz okay thank you very much we are expecting now from uh, uh the practical <laughs> deployment uh, of 5g maybe uh if in the case of a uh, practically applied we have uh, many uh research subject uh, yep. such as, uh, uh radio zone estimation evaluation method yes yes you're right yeah, yeah. That is very potential important. potential big potential for for research area yeah mm. okay thank you very much i pass to uh another person all right thank you prof yamada Thank you, Dr. Mandel, and so on. So, uh, I think we can accept another question. Is there any question from the floor? Uh, ask, okay, uh, Prof. Sakatibara, uh, you can ask now. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Uh, Prof. Sakatibara, uh, connecting from Japan. Hi, hi, Prof. Uh, uh, thank you for your uh, nice presentation. Uh, I want to ask one thing about your uh, about your talk. Uh, uh, today uh, you talk about uh, general application about the five G, but I'm interested in a five G application in Malaysia. Uh, do you have any special requirements uh, applied in Malaysia different from uh, worldwide application of five G? Uh, at the moment. Uh okay in terms of the setup in malaysia we have the wholesale uh 5g provider that is uh, providing the service to each telco so each telco that the user connected does not have uh the frequency the frequency in the wholesale so there is the discussion on the other services apart from the embb that you're, you're mentioning right uh for uh, for the telco that may may be interested maybe on the ar vr but uh the, i'm not part of the discussion so i'm not sure uh, as currently uh we okay there there one one the the main services is still embb in malaysia uh if you go to malaysia the company uh, the the company that do the wholesale network for 5g is called dmb the international Brahat. they are based in trx in kuala lumpur uh there is the uh use uh, so it's a user experience center uh so i think they they have shown like so for example ar vr uh i'm not sure for for others uh that is uh available there for uh so-called exhibition so that is on the on the business side uh, uh of, of the implementation but we uh some of uh, the the members for university uh, for example in utm and and i'm and, and the industry we work together to also do the documentation right uh, of the technical code like I mentioned so first we have the 5g technical code ready as a guidance uh for the 5g deployment in malaysia right for the industry and for the public we also have the technical code for example we want to go for volte or vonr uh and and as I mentioned there is also technical code on v2x vehicle to vehicle actually the chair is from utm uh, yeah. <laughs> uh so uh we, i'm also part of the working group we are working on it so we we are okay if you look at the global uh setup also right we have embb okay uh, most of the country have it and private network is where we start to have let's say company like Petronas or even Japan, maybe I don't know Panasonic or so on, right? They have private network. So so far, I only see these two: uh, public services and private network, where you have the slicing or the specific uh, uh, resource being used at the industry. And for the private network, it's just a 
I, I see just uh, to get the throughput for the, and, and the latency. Whoever connect to the uh, AGV, connect to the uh, robotic arm, uh, to the CCTV. So, in the same as Malaysia, we also have private networks uh, in, in Petronas. Uh, so, all, so far, only these two uh, services that, uh, that I can see uh, from, from, from my, my, my end, uh, Professor. Mm, okay. Uh, uh, for example, the local 5G system uh, can be uh, uh, an automated system uh, which requires more uh, special requirements. Yeah, yeah, correct. Okay. correct yeah, but I, uh, there's, uh, I think there's other entity that is working on that. <laughs> mm, okay. So uh, I hope to discuss in the next uh, MJWRP in August. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> I think uh, we have to uh, stop the Q&A for Ms. Anwar. So thank you very much uh, to Mr. Anwar. Um, and before we proceed to the next agenda, is it okay if we uh, take a photo now? Yeah, uh, sure. uh, if everyone can switch on your camera. Oh yeah, uh, Mr. Anwar, is it okay for you to stop sharing your slide? Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. And appreciate for all the participants to switch on your camera, please. Thank you. Can we have uh, more camera being switched on, please? Thank you. Oh, the two down, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I will uh, count. <laughs> one, two, three, smile. Okay, another one. One, two, three, smile. Okay. okay, thank you very much. So we will proceed with the next agenda. Thank you very much, Mr. Anwar. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. All right. <laughs> Uh, hold on. Right. Okay, so uh, before we proceed to the next speaker, uh, we would like to announce that uh, our next AP Technical Meeting Series 2 will be held uh, physically, uh, actually a uh, hybrid, but for the speaker uh, and the uh, uh, interested uh, participant, uh, we can join it uh, physically at uh, IIUM, International Islamic University of Malaysia at the Kuliah of Engineering. So the invited speaker will be Mr. Moaz uh, M. Zain from Petronas ETS PDNT as well as Professor Dr. Muhammad Rafiqul Islam from IIUM. So the topics will be both the antenna and propagation. So, uh, okay, so um, we also open for the student presentation uh, for this second series. Uh, to be presented physically, so you can uh, go to this uh, link and uh, register to present for the session. And for the participant, uh, you can also register to join either physically or uh, via online. So we we shall conduct this high hybrid. Right. So with that, we will proceed with the next presenter, which will be the student research presentation. So. First, we have uh, Mr. Muhammad Shami Fikri Osman from University of Technology Malaysia. So uh, he will be presenting um, his uh, research titled Analysis of Antisy Radio Wave Attenuation at 13 MHz at different depth. So the, uh, the research is uh, between Mr. Shota, um, Prof. Yamada, and um, myself. So, uh, so the, this is the abstract of his. Uh, So, um, 
you have 10 minutes presentation and another person will go through as well. So we may do you. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. Can you uh, click on the uh, um make your slide bigger? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm uh, Presentation view. Presentation view, Mr. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So you may begin. Yeah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Muhammad Sharif Fitri Gosman. Uh, currently a master student at University of Technology Malaysia. And today I will present about uh, AM simulation of undersea radio wave link. And this research I'm cooperate with Shotan Agai with the supervision of uh, Dr. Uh, Prof. Dr. Yoshi De Yamada and Dr. Camelia. I are listening to Dr. Camelia. So, so uh, this is our outline for today. And I will present about the, this project. So for the introduction, um uh this is the uh correct uh, this is the undersea wireless media uh for the undersea and from here we can see the uh, uh sorry oops sorry. Uh, maybe sorry yeah uh, uh, so, uh, Hold on, there's uh, some technical issues. Please tell me. I'm just cleaning. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, um, can you please do like three minutes, maybe? Uh, sorry for the cover. Uh, some time uh,
Okay, uh, Mr. Shamim, are you still there? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay, so you can uh, proceed. Uh, we will play this slide for you. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. So here uh, I will show you some of the wireless communication media utilized at the sea. So the ultrasound waves are mostly used in conventional wireless communication at sea. Uh, the electromagnetic wave. Um, the electromagnetic wave and light travel quicker than the sound wave. Uh, however, the sound wave have uh, little propagation loss, but they travel slowly and uh, heavily impact by reflected waves from numerous objects. Um, then the visible light can travel at great speeds, although it is influenced by water quality and plankton. And because of the significant losses in seawater, the EM wave have not been used for communication purpose. However, in, in certain situation, uh, such as in deep sea water, uh, electromagnetic wave can facilitate communication that sound wave or light cannot. Okay, next. <laughs> See, this uh, our research objectives. Uh, first, to analyze the attenuation of the normal mode helical antenna in seawater and secondly, to obtain the data for measurement tank. <laughs> Next. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So, for antenna structure, the self-resonance structure is the main thing to be achieved when designing our uh, normal mode helical antenna. <laughs> so, the antenna structure was calculated using MATLAB software. Uh, the length uh, H and D is the diameter are normalized to the wavelength of the seawater. <coughs> the self resonance can be achieved by setting the structural parameters H, D, and N using this self resonance equation. And based on the Willis equation, the empirical inductive rectus expression on the left side was obtained. <coughs> And then the capacitive reactance formula was obtained at the right side after derived the using the value of C, Q, and the star electrical energy in NMHA. <coughs> and then by adjusting the value of H and D, the resonance is achieved at the 13.67 megahertz for number of turns uh, N20 and 30 number of turn is shown in this graph. So next. Uh, next for the input impedance. <coughs> Here I show you the electric field distribution uh, and the smith chart. So in this smith chart, due to variations in conductivity, it is demonstrated that uh, when conductivity rise, uh, the input resistance rises as well. Then uh, the equation, uh, the value from this mid chart was used in this equation to compute the antenna efficiency, which we get is minus 22 decibel. And next. <clears throat> okay, so for our simulation. <clears throat> First, we analyze the radio wave propagation uh, in underwater. Um, this is the simulation model in FECO simulator using uh, a method of moment. The operating frequency is 13.67 megahertz and the electric constant of the seawater, uh, permittivity of 80 and conductivity of 4. Um, okay, so in this simulation, the normal mode helical antenna is used with length of 22.2 cm with diameter of 12.2 cm and number of turn of 20. And it was positioned at the center of the tank with the depth of 5 meter. Okay, next. 
Okay, uh, here is the new fit simulation at 10 meter cubic area done in FECO. So we can see the lateral wave at the water surface here. Um, also, there are reflection and lateral wave appear in the wall in the wall of the seawater tank at the border. Okay. So next. Um, okay, this is the comparison of attenuation between the simulation and theoretical. Um, so click next. Okay, so uh, here is the border of the tank and we can see the increase uh, next again. We can see the increase uh, due to the effect of lateral wave and reflection at the wall area, uh, making this value uh, height near this three meter to five meter. Okay. Next. <coughs> okay. Uh, so to uh, reduce the to reduce the uh, lateral effect, uh, we are trying to use the simulation with impedance matching structure. Uh, so as we can see, the reflection effect is reduced at the bottom. However, the lateral waves still appear at the water surface and side of the wall. Okay, so to reduce the lateral wave effect, uh, we also trying to add the trap structure uh, at the water surface to reduce the lateral wave flowing at the side of the wall. Um, okay, next. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, we can see the strong lateral wave is observed at the water surface, and at the tank wall area, the large electric power has appeared and to reduce the electric field at wall area, uh, the lateral wave trap structure and impedance matching structure are studied for this research. So, okay. next. Okay, so that's all from me. Uh, thank you for listening for my presentation today. Thank you, Mr. Shaman, for the presentation. So we will open for five minutes to an essay for uh, Do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, you can ask live. Uh, just, uh, just let me know and you can ask right away uh, the question. Or if you're shy, you can just start the question in the chat box. Uh, hi, uh, Mr. Shamim, right? uh, I'm Najib from uh, University of Malaysia Police. Um, uh, good to know that uh, you are doing this uh, water antennas. Uh, I have a question to ask you. Um, do, where do you think that you will have the measurement um, with the large of uh, the antennas? I assume that it will be large because the frequency is quite low. And mm -hmm. uh, are you planning to do something uh, in uh, in the sea or some somewhere in locations, or you're you're looking for indoor uh, measurements? Thank you. Um, okay, uh, thank you for the question. Um, for measurement, uh, we are um for, for simulation, we are trying at the uh, using the ten meter cubic area, but for measurement, uh, that's uh, not possibly for our measurement because of uh, the tank is too big. So <clears throat> for practical uh, measurement, maybe we will using a uh, smaller uh, tank. Uh, and we are now are trying to use uh, impedance matching structure to reduce the uh, attenuation effect at the wall area. So now we are still uh, uh, studying for this <coughs> uh, this effect. Thank you, uh, Dr. Najib. Any more questions from the audience? Okay, uh, Prof. Uh, you may ask. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you, you showed us uh, a matching characteristics, but uh, uh, how is uh, radiation pattern? Uh, radiation pattern is the same with in in the air. Uh, radiation pattern. Radiation pattern. Radiation pattern is the same with. Uh, the antenna in the air or oh, the uh, can you hear me oh yes yes okay so, uh, so for the radiation pattern uh, for now we are simulating for the new field and the radiation pattern for the uh, sea water is different with air because of the different in uh, conductivity and the permittivity. So mm -hmm. the radiation uh, at the head, uh, you can see here the radiation at the sea water should be this blue one uh, and the green one is uh, the radiation in air. <coughs> okay. Do you have any requirements for the radiation pattern for this application? Sorry? Uh, do you have any requirements for the radiation pattern in this application? The, the requirement. Okay. And for now, uh, still. No requirement for the redistribution. So this is your mother. Mm. Hello? Okay. Hello. Mm, yes. <laughs> Radiation uh, high uh, gain antenna may be uh, uh, welcome. However, the mm. frequency is a very low frequency to mm. achieve uh, the activity in the antenna. That is very difficult. So uh, that uh, high gain antenna design is uh, a future uh, subject. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one more thing about uh, the the metal antenna is uh, I worry about the oxidization for the uh, metal antenna. So uh, I think it's be it's better to choose uh, directly antenna. Uh, to, to prevent the oxidization. Mm. <laughs> and I also, uh, maybe the uh, oxidize water with the skills and we made it uh, oxidize the skill for the antenna. Oxidize. Uh, Karate, uh, correction. Uh, Sabi, Sabiru, to. Okay. We will uh, consider later. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kibara, uh, as well as uh, the presenter, Mr. Sami. So we go next to the next presenter, which is Mr. Sophia, who will. Uh, presenting uh, his topic title uh, application of graph graphic as phase shifting element for designing terahertz configurable display array so he is uh, the student of uh, associate professor dr muhammad ramli samarike and professor yasida mada from the institution on the square with the academy so with that uh mr sokai uh, you can uh, Hello, Slankum. Uh, can you all see my screen? Okay. Uh, this is me, uh, Soil Oscar Qureshi. I'm a PhD student at uh, UTHM Malaysia under the supervision of uh, Dr. Ramli Kamardin. Uh, 
I am currently positioned in MGIT under the supervision of Dr. Uh, Sensei Yoshida Yamada Sensei. My presentation topic is beam steering characteristics of a reconfigurable reflectory antenna for 6G applications. So we know that uh, coming to the background, uh, why I have chosen this topic. Uh, the, since we know that uh, 5G uh, applications have been uh, announced recently and currently being uh, deployed, so uh, they also face challenges in its development. But when we move to the future, uh, it's 60. So it also has the uh, some sort of same challenges, which is the path loss, no line of sight communication, signal fading, uh, low signal to noise ratio. So to avoid those issues. Uh, uh, RIS has been proposed. Uh, so uh, RIS is a reflective intelligence surface, uh, which uh, consists of the uh, reflectory element and the microcontrol uh, unit. So it uh, avoids the path of loss, which is a blockage uh, between the base station and the users. So in order to uh, uh, transfer the signals from the base station and avoiding the blocks, uh, we use the uh, RIS reflective material surfaces. Uh, in this way, uh, we can control the beam of the uh, base station and uh, trace the location of the users. Uh, no matter where they go, the path will be tracing it and the signals uh, will be uh, continuously reaching towards them. So RIS is basically uh, uh, consisting of the reflectory unit, so which is controlled through the microcontroller circuit. So in this presentation, I will be focusing on the reflectory side of the uh, RIS. So uh, reflectory is basically the combination of the, the phased array antenna and the parabolic reflector. So in when we talk about parabolic reflector, uh, it is the parabolic shape is shown in this uh, green area. So uh, when the uh, signal strikes from the horn antenna to the parabolic reflector, mm -hmm. it, it uh, compensates the phase uh, arriving from the horn antenna. And in the reflection, we have the planar reflection, which uh, is uh, in form of the pencil beam. So but uh, in comparison to the parabolic reflector, our uh, reflector antenna is the planar uh, structure. So in order to compensate for the phase delay caused from this point to this point, so uh, we have to adjust the uh, reflection phases for each of the uh, elements, uh, resonant elements, so that we can compensate them and take this planar reflector is the uh, parabolic reflector and uh, cause the beam uh, uh, in reflection is a pencil beam. So this phasing mechanism is dependent on the uh, resonant elements which are baked by the ground on its backside. And every unit cell has its own uh, distinct uh, phase, reflection coefficient phase. So uh, this is how we achieve the beam steering uh, in uh, ref reflectory. So uh, for example, we first design the reflectory, uh, full reflectory, which consists of the different uh, resonant elements. Each of the resonant elements having different reflection coefficient phase. For example, in this one, we say the first element has the reflection phase V1, second is V2, third is V3, V4, V5. So goes on for the uh, limited number of unit cells. So each of the element have different uh, phase. So in this way, we can achieve the pencil beam in its reflection, and the reflection is the planar wave. So when we want to change the direction of the beam towards any other direction, for example, we want the reflection at the beam too. So we will have to change the phase delay caused by each of the elements so that if in one side of the reflector, we have uh, further phase delay, and others another side we will have the phase advanced. So in this way, we can cause the beam to be reflected. So 
if we want the beam to be reflected further, we will have to cause further delay in the unit cell elements. And on the other side, we will have to cause the phase advance so that we can have the further uh, angle of uh, beam steering. So for this purpose, our aim is to design the uh, graphene-based reconfigurable reflector antenna. And uh, for this purpose, uh, we integrate uh, the uh, gold patch elements with the graphene uh, material. Uh, here, graphene acts as the phase shifting element uh, in RIS. Uh, and we, our final objective is to design the one bit reconfigurable reflector antenna for 1D beam steering capability. So this is the idea of our reconfigurable reflector antenna, which is the reflector part of the RIS. So in this one, uh, reflection characteristics are expressed against different phase delay required for each unit of the reflector, depending on the location on the aperture. So for example, we have the uh, horn anti feed antenna over here, and uh, based on the distance from the uh, feed antenna, each of the uh, resonant elements on uh, aperture is required to have a specific uh, phase delay. So we calculate using this equation phase delay required for each of the resonant elements based on the distance from horn antenna. Here, Ri uh, represents the uh, distance of the each of the elements from the horn antenna, which is expected to be at the Z location. So, uh, but here theta and phi uh, represent the angle of reflection, which is here, uh, we see, we show here. So in this way, for example, we uh, are working at 115 gigahertz. So our array consists of the uh, 799 elements uh, on a, a 30 millimeter uh, uh, array, which consists of many uh, unit cells uh, representing here at the phase delay for each of the unit cell is represented by this code blocks. So. Uh, in this way, we can say that uh, initially if we have uh, designed the array to be reflected uh, at zero degree. Like if the horn antenna is here, the uh, reflection will be exactly at the opposite angle, normal to the surface of antenna. So we call this center to be the face center of the array. Since we are working on reconfigurable reflector antenna, uh, all of the Elements typically in reflector array, uh, the dimensions are changed, but in reconfigurable reflector array, we keep the dimensions of the resonant elements same and we integrate the phase shifting element by which we control the uh, phase delay required for each of the unit cells. So, in this case, we are using graphene. And for graphene, when it is applied with a 15 voltage, it is different conductivity, and when it is applied with no voltage, it is different conductivity. So, based on the applied voltage, we control the phase delay required for each of the cell. So here's the pattern for phase distribution, uh, E-field phase distribution, distribution. So when the reflection uh, comes back from the reflector, it should be planar. So in this uh, E-field pattern, we can see that uh, here, at this position, uh, there is an array. And from this position, the uh, wave is being transmitted from the feed. In the reflection, if we focus after the horn antenna, the reflection is uh, so far uh, planar and its uh, phase uh, is uh, very much consistent, which shows us that our uh, reflector is working properly. Now, uh, coming to the beam steering point. Uh, our objective is to steer the beam as I showed in earlier slide. Uh, but in this concept, uh, how uh, we simply can steer the beam uh, by uh, changing the phase delay. We can simply change the phase center of the array electronically, like uh, controlling the voltage of graphene for each of the unit cell. Like uh, we need to create an angle of theta. So initially, suppose uh, here uh, we had the uh, phase center of the uh, uh, array directly in front of the horn antenna, feed antenna. 
but what if we move our face center of the array uh, to a different position so it will create an angle uh, of theta from the normal to the surface so this theta will uh, be our uh, uh, reflected uh, steering angle so here this is the reflected angle from this uh, direction to this direction our reflection will also cause an angle of theta so simply by this uh, we can uh, imagine about the right triangle so here uh, our distance from the feed antenna to the array is 30 millimeter so to calculate this angle we will need to divide is it if the distance from the normal to the surface of antenna and the horn antenna and the distance from the uh, horn antenna to the face center of the array so in this case we can calculate the theta angle uh, which will uh, cause the angle to be steered to the angle th theta so as we first designed the reflect array our face center was at the uh, right at the center of the array so our uh, reflection will be exactly at the opposite or normal to the surface. But uh, in another case, we when we move the, the face center of uh, array to be a little bit uh, shifted on the upside. So it will cause an angle of theta 10 degree. So our reflection will also be at the 10 degree. And when we move our face center a little bit further, our theta angle will be 20 degree. And when we move a little further, so we'll follow the same procedure for the steering. And uh, by the, uh, oh. so by further uh, advancing the distance, uh, we increase the beam steering angle. Mm -hmm. So here's the summary uh, for beam steering uh, of our design reflector. Our beam steering range is about uh, 40 degree, uh, where we have the consistent uh, gain uh, with loss less than minus one dB. Our maximum gain is about 24 d uh, dBi, which represents the upper e efficiency of 21%. So, and uh, reflect array has bandwidth also in our design reflect array. Uh, minus three dB bandwidth is uh, uh, 13%. In conclusion, an RRA has been proposed for 60 frequencies and approach of using uh, mm -hmm. the graphene as phase shifting element has been studied in lambda by two dimension for each of the element of array. Electronically beam, beam steering has been achieved for one bit RRA and beam steering range of up to 40 <coughs> degrees and for avoiding no line of sight communication. And the design uh, RRA can be integrated with the microcontroller for the development of CZ uh, RI systems. So that's it all from me. Uh, if you have questions, uh, you can ask me. Thank you, Mr. Chauhan, for the presentation. So we open for Q&A. And Hi. Hi. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm Najib again. I'm from Inibet. I'm very interested in this work uh, on the RIS. Uh, previously, you are saying that uh, you are doing the recovery intelligence phase at the 100. Mm -hmm gigahertz right um yeah. can i see your unit cell uh unit cell uh it's like this it's one unit cell all right uh, are you using the quantization method or you are uh, you are not using quantization method you would say that you are have the one bit right yeah it's just one bit on what do you mean by one bit actually uh, one bit uh, basically means uh, we are changing the phase of the element based on the applied voltage. Uh, like either we are applying the voltage to the element or we are not applying the voltage to the element. Yeah, what the what the the bit why we call a bit actually? What is different on the phase? The phase on the phase uh, the difference is uh, when we apply the 15 voltage, the reflection coefficient phase ranges from 120 to 290. And when we apply no voltage, uh, so in other cases, it will be a different phase. I, in this sense, uh, we will need to apply 15 voltage. I think you need to further make the clarification. As bit as I know, one bit is different between the zero and 180 degrees. So you it become digitally. Have you using the diode on the design or you are not using the diode? I'm using the graphene for, uh, since the diode yeah. is very difficult. I mean, uh, I mean, did you how you you make it reconfigurable actually? Using the graphene. Using the graphene. 
so yeah. so the so the, the face is different is it the one bit right? oh. yes exactly okay i if i can see the uh, the graphic the unit size will be great but uh, i think it's a very good project but um so have you integrated the uh, the controller in your design or you are not using the controller uh, currently uh, this is only on the simulation side uh, so hopefully in future we will be designing controller so you are using at 115 gigahertz right yeah okay all right um uh, what well, just one last question uh for mm -hmm. your design uh, at the uh, your beam steering part can you show me the beam steering yeah yeah this one uh not the yeah okay uh, i see you see at 50 degree there are yeah. a lot of uh i mean there are a lot of um, other signals it's not accurately to 50 degrees so uh, yeah actually yeah actually uh when we calculate the angle theoretically we have this one but as we uh, go to the reconfigured reflector array, they have maximum steering uh, ranges of about 50 or 60 degrees. So, so my, 50 degree is not that great. You, you uh, yeah, we can see that uh, the range is of about 40 degrees. The, what the best is 40 degrees? Uh, up to 40 degrees, we can go in this design. Oh, what's your size actually for your array? Uh, array size is actually uh, 30 millimeter. No, no. What the? I mean, uh, the element 13 times 13 or what? Is there any anything? Uh, no. Uh, you go in the circles, right? How many elements yeah, I mean, in the circle? How many in the circle? Uh, it would be, I think, around uh, 900 or something. 900. So it, it's a passive. It's an active element. You 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 going to put the, uh, each voltage uh, on each element. Yes, exactly. So you do it in CSD. You put it yeah. on and off, or you just put the ideal case on and off. Uh, uh, this is based on this one. Uh, when I uh, in the uh, properties of graphene, so I have this range of phase reflection coefficient phase. But uh, in other cases, I use uh, like uh, low conductivity for graphene. So in uh, otherwise. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Najib and Mr. Shohar. Any one more last question from the floor? Any questions? Um, hi. Um, may I ask one question? Yes, yes, yes. Please, Dr. Najib. All right. Uh, I'm Huda from UITM. Um, normally, when we see research on RIS, we use a lot of active switchings, and we realize that for your frequency, those uh, active elements doesn't exist, right? So that's why you yeah. use graphene. So may yeah. I know how actually you implement graphene with the same function as uh, diodes, um, switch, and so on? How? Because we know graphene is like the material, but how do you actually implement graphene to make sure that that the uh, that it does the function as the switch or diodes? Uh, yes, Doctor Huda, this is a good question actually. So uh, in this design, uh, I'm using graphene as the phase shifting element only. Basically, graphene is a kind of material uh, which resonates uh, at very small wavelength of about lambda by eight or uh, some. Where the searchers are also designed it lambda by 16 for it to resonate. But in my case, I have integrated uh, graphene with the gold page element so that uh, when uh, I change the properties of the uh, graphene, so it acts as the on or off uh, element like diodes. Um, okay, I understand. Thank you. Okay. okay thank you, Mr. Tohar and Dr. Duda. Uh, so uh, thank you, Mr. Sohar. So we will um, proceed with the next presenter. So thank you, Mr. Sohar, for the presentation. Uh, so the next presentation will be by Mr. Arslan Ahmed Toho from UST Tunisian on Malaysia UST Uh So we will be presenting uh, his topic titled study on circular follow-up guide approach for EDSL and 60 
in social studies. So the work is uh, with the uh, associate professor, Dr. Fauzia Kajim Cheksaman, VCP, um, and Ifar Ahmed Sofi. So uh, you have 10 minutes for the presentation and uh, five minutes for two ahead. So with that, I leave the floor to Mr. Asnaf Kasu. Mr. Aslan, are you there? Okay. Um. So, can you see my slides? Yes, you can see the slides. Okay, Assalamu alaikum to everyone. Uh, it's me, Arslan Ahmed, and I am a PhD student under Dr. Fodia Hanam Kisiman uh, in UTHM. Uh, so, my title is Hello Circular Website <laughs> Approach for the TTSL and 6G initiative studies. So uh, these are the contents of my presentation. So first of all, introduction, uh, as we all know that electromagnetic spectrum is a limited source and it is being consumed day by day. Especially below six cigars, it's almost full. We have 3G, we have 5G, we have uh, other technologies that are below Six cigars that are it's, it's, it's most full. So the researchers are looking forward to utilize this limited spectrum efficiently to meet the future needs. So we have an option to move toward the higher frequencies, such as terahertz frequencies and infrared frequencies. Also, recently, the FCC has opened the free license for the terahertz spectrum uh, for the testing purpose. That's from 95 gigahertz to Three terahertz. Also, the 6G will be utilizing the terahertz spectrum, uh, such as F band, D band, G band, Y band, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Then there are a number of bands that are proposed for the 6G communication. Uh, so we all know that for the wired as wireless, we all need very high data rate speed. We have currently 4G, we have 5G, uh, we have D fast, we have M fast. Uh, they have good, they provide good speed, as you can see on the right side. They provide the good speed, but the future communication, such as the augmented reality, holographical communication, machine to machine communication, they all need even more data rate in DPPS for the future communication. As you can see here, for 6G, uh, it will be in uh, 2030, and they require about the, the data rate of TPPS. Uh, so for the wire communication, uh, we have one promising solution that is optical fibers. And uh, yes, and optical fibers meets the future needs because the highest speed that is achieved by the optical fiber is 1.02 petabits per second over 51.7 kilometer. And it is huge speed over a very long distance. But uh, there are some issues uh, that it's, full, it's fully implementation, it's too far. I mean, fiber to the home is still too far due to the different reasons that are a huge capital cost because it costs just very expensive for, uh, for installation uh, about three thousand dollars per home and development leg time it will take time uh, to for as you know it's a government uh, policies and mm -hmm. it will take time and innovate in repairing mm -hmm. building ctc and it required the very high uh, skill levers so mm -hmm. it will take time to reach the feth at homes so we need some uh, prompt, prompt solution. So we have a prompt solution, and that is terabit DSL, known as TDSL. Uh, so uh, in 2K18, John Coffey, he proposed solution, uh, the idea of TDSL, TDSL, to use the already installed wires to propagate the terahertz waves wirelessly. As you can see here in the figure, uh, this is a copper binder, a copper wire that's already installed. Uh, we can see the Ethernet cables. 
Uh, these oranges are the copper wires. This blue one is a dielectric. And this green one is the air space between the wires. So you can see this triangular space. We can use this triangular space to propagate the terahertz waves wirelessly between the wires. So this space can be used for the propagation mm -hmm. of terahertz waves wirelessly. So this is the idea that is proposed by John Coffey in 2K18. Some literature review uh, in 2K13, uh, two wires and three wires were used to propagate the terahertz waves. And 2K19, the simulation was performed by uh, Souza D. She simulated the copper binder, uh, four pair wires, and she calculated the uh, estimated data rate that is about 3 TBPS for 10 meters. And in 2K2020, uh, Rabesh Rista, she used two wires enclosed in a metallic shield to propagate the terahertz waves wirelessly. As you can see here, this is a terahertz uh, emitter, this is a terahertz receiver, and this is a metallic shield. And inside there are copper wires to propagate the terahertz waves. And in 2K22, uh, these elliptical and circular guides are used for the propagation of the terahertz waves. Uh, for the experimental, different scientists have used different uh, techniques for the for the measurement. So these are the waveguides. Web, web and uh, this is the terahertz spectroscopy setup. How uh, we can characterize, we can measure, uh, we can characterize the waveguides. You can see different applications. This is FS laser, and these are the emitters, and the detectors, the mirrors, and the deflectors. And this is a different configuration uh, proposed by different scientists in this in the literature review. So for the simulation analysis, we have used the simulation uh, CST micro extractor tool, and for the band we have used is 100 to 300 gigahertz. It is most uh, proposed band by different researchers, scientists, and companies. And we have used the time domain solvers, mm -hmm. and this band also covers the D band, which is the best, uh, we can the most recommended band for the 6G communication. And the parameters which we are interested in is S parameters, uh, proportion constant, etc. Mm -hmm. So as we know, uh, as we can see here on the right side, this is a K6 cable. Uh, we can see the Ethernet cable. It is mm -hmm. has four pair of wires. We can see this. One pair, two pair, three pair, and four pair. They are coated in aluminum. Make and this one is this plus sign is a dielectric separator. Yeah. So we can use this space for propagation of the terahertz waves wirelessly. So this is something similar to the uh, circular shape. So we have we are using this space for the propagation of the terahertz waves. So this is this space is nearly about two to three millimeter. In the K6 cable. So we are using uh, the similar dimension of circular wave guide to see the how waves are propagating uh, through this tiny space. Mm -hmm. so just to mimic with how it behaves, so how the waves will pass through a small and narrow uh, wave guide and narrow space. So we are using this circular wave guide with similar dimensions like the air, air and dilated space. So we have some initial simulation results. So on the left we have the admission constant, uh, uh, the S parameters. You can see this is 100 to 300 gigahertz. This is our uh, proposed band. Uh, you can see the S1 one is very much uh, good, and also the S2 one is near zero, except this. Except this uh, near 100, we have some ripples, but uh, but all over uh, the band, it is uh, it is giving the good results. On the right, we have the addition constant alpha. You can see here throughout the band from 100 to 300 gigahertz. It is below, uh, we can say, 1 or, 0, 1 or 0 0.5 or something. But here at 100 gigahertz, it is a little bit high. It is due to the cutoff frequency. Because for the 2 millimeter waveguide, as I see here, for the 2 millimeter waveguide, uh, the cutoff frequency is uh, literally near about 97 gigahertz. So due to the cutoff frequency, we have some high losses here. But above here, you can see that they, are, they have too many low losses. 
So I've taken a radius on the pyramid, different pyram uh, parameters. So as we can see here, S11, uh, when diameter is 2 millimeter, when diameter is 3 millimeter, 4, 5, and 6. Uh, so on the right side, it's just S21. So you can see for the 2 millimeter diameter, it is almost above the 100 uh, gigahertz. So we cannot use it. Uh, we cannot use more narrower for the proposed band. So because the band is 100 to 300 gigahertz. So we have uh, simulated seven, uh, first seven moves in the CST micro studio, and we have calculated the cutoff cut frequencies. You can see here the first seven modes. This is the TE11 mode. Uh, this is the fundamental mode. Uh, this is the second mode. This is the TE11 orthogonal. Uh, this is the TM01 mode uh, up to these seven uh, modes. So, effect of modes on propagation. So, you can see for the first mode, uh, the delay uh, the from input to output delay is about 0 0.12 uh, nanosecond. For uh, mode 2 is same because they both are same uh, modes. For 3, it is increased, and you, you can see at mode 7, it is 0 0.21 nanosecond delay. So the higher modes have the more delays. Also, output peak to peak, the output power received at the uh, second end. So for mode 1, it is about 1.075, and it decreases with the mode. For mode 7, it is 0 0.04. So uh, this was only some simulation uh, results. So we can say uh, these webguides are these uh, case is capable. If there is some uh, air space and the dielectric space, we can use this space uh, for the propagation of the terahertz waves. So actually, we don't have some devices till now. But if in future we have some terahertz devices and we can, if we can easily couple the terahertz waves to the air gap or the dielectric gap, uh, we can propagate the terahertz waves wirelessly to uh, obtain the very high data rate speed and 6D and 3DSL concept. Uh, these are some references. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, any questions? Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, okay. I'm interested in a feeding circuit. Uh, do you have any idea to realize uh, any feeding circuit to excite the propagation mode? Yes, uh, actually, the main, the main issue for the terahertz is the feeding or the coupling terahertz waves into the receive guides. So for, for my case, I'm using the te uh, time domain terahertz spectroscopy, and I'm trying to feed uh, the waves from 2, 4. And it's a big challenge because we don't have uh, still we don't have the VNA in the terahertz range. So it's very, di very difficult, uh, challenging to couple, uh, to uh, feed the waves inside the waveguide. So for now, I'm just working on the terahertz spectroscopy technique uh, equipment so to feed. As we do, we don't know we do. As we don't uh, don't have the uh, VNA in the range of uh, terahertz, uh, terahertz range. Mm. Yes, uh, the measurement is uh, uh, one of the program. Yes, okay. yes. Mm, thank you. So, in your research, are you not planning to have any measurement? Are you planning to have any measurement work or no measurement work for your work? Yes, I'm not getting. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm just curious because you were saying that you have no equipment. So, in your PhD work, uh, are you intending uh, to include measurement or no measurement will be involved? Uh, I, I'm doing um, the, uh, the measurement work also. I'm, in, I'm on the way to uh, on, on the measurements. So I have few measurement results, but uh, it's still not uh, ready. But I'm working on the measurements. All right, all right, okay, thank you. So any more questions from the floor? We can accept one more question, I think. Any more questions? No? 
All right, okay. Uh, I think there's no more questions for Mr. Aslan. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Aslan. Um, okay, uh, before, uh, thank you very much to the main speaker, Mr. Anwar, and the three student speakers for UPM and UPM and UPHM. Uh, for today's sharing, and we also would like to thank very much to the, all the participants. So, uh, you can get the certificate uh, as a participant, but you need to click on the uh, form that we have shared in the chat box. So, before we adjourn, uh, we would like to um, uh, let you know that we will have this AP Technical Meeting Series number two uh, on. Tuesday, 5th of March, uh, 10 a.m. at uh, International Islamic University in Malaysia in Bombay, uh, Kuala Lumpur, uh, the, uh, in at the main conference room, Block E1, Julia of Engineering. So we will have these two speakers, Mr. Muaz Amzin from Petronas and Professor Rafiqul from IIUM itself. So uh, if you would like to be the student presenter, you can uh, register at this link. And if you would like to join physically, you are hybrid online, you can also register at this link. So uh, with that, uh, we would like to thank very much to all the presenters as well as the audience. Uh, and uh, we will see you again at the second uh, AP Technical Meeting Series. With that, uh, we thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Sakatibara, <laughs> joining us from Japan. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, today, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Our first meeting uh, finished uh, successfully. I expect the this uh, meeting will continue from now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's fun to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.